Welcome to my presentation, Beyond Birthday Bound Secure Fresh Rekeying, Application to Authenticated Encryption. Many cryptography schemes that we use nowadays are based on a block cipher. Uh, typical examples are counter mode encryption, CBC encryption, the OCP uh, authenticated encryption schemes. But these schemes, they often evaluate a secret key repeatedly. So they use the secret key many times during the lifetime of the key. And to show you this, let's look at a typical construction, which is a Tata CP authenticated encryption scheme. And the Tata CP authenticated encryption scheme is a generalization of OCB1, OCB2, OCB3. Um, it is based on a tweakable block cipher. And this tweakable block cipher is used as evaluated many times, always for the same key. And then you have some tweak, which is different for every evaluation. You've got associated data and message checksum that get processed to obtain the tag. And you've got the messages that get encrypted independently to get the ciphertext. And for now, it's not important how that CB works exactly and why it's secure. What's important is that the same key is used for every tweakable block cipher evaluation. And while in a black box setting, this might not be a problem, if you consider this evaluation in a um, in a fragile environment, um, one might be able to obtain leakage from the key. And if the key is used many, many times, you get repeated evaluation of the key and hence repeated leakage of the key. And one must make sure that this is not a problem. So one must protect the scheme against, and one must protect the key against this kind of leakage. And one way of protection is implementation protection. The idea is that you take a very simple, a very lightweight scheme, but you put protection on top. And protection on top would, for instance, be masking or hiding. Um, and while the scheme is very efficient, this makes uh, the countermeasure typically design specific and sometimes rather expensive. Um, alternatively, you can invest a bit more in the mode, you get a more solid mode, um, but then you don't need to put protection on the side. So you get protection by design. Sometimes it's less efficient. In fact, the, the older solutions, many block cipher-based solutions were less efficient. Nowadays, we've, we have seen some quite efficient uh, solutions, mostly permutation-based solutions. Um, but there is also a method in the middle and that combines the, the best of both um, approaches. So this approach uses leakage resilience um, where it's needed and it uses implementation protected where that one is needed. And this approach is known as rekeying. And it can be seen as a method in the middle. So as I said, as said it uses leakage resilience where that one is needed and implementation protection where um, implementation protection is needed. It's also known as a leveled implementation. And more detailed, the idea of parallel fresh rekeying is here that you make scarce use of the key material. And the key material that you eva the, the evaluations of the key are strongly protected. So this means a strong protection is only needed for cryptographically light building blocks. In detail, a rekeying scheme is um, typically put on top of a block cipher, where you have the message that goes into the cipher text. And now instead of putting the key to the block cipher, you put a subkey to the block cipher, which is derived from the key and the rekeyer. So the rekeying function, the core, uh, the rekeying function um, typically needs strong protection against, for instance, DPA, because the key is evaluated repeatedly. But this function turns out not to, it turns out that this function does not need to be cryptographically strong. The core must be cryptographically strong because it deals with the message, but it only needs slighter, uh, lighter protection against, for instance, SPA, because it does not use the key, but only a subkey, which is used once or twice. Um, the idea of parallel fresh reeking um, was formalized by Abdallah and Bellara in 2000. Um, Abdallah and Bellara looked at the construction that's here on the right. So you have the message, it goes to the cipher text, and the subkey is derived from a PRF evaluated on the key and the rekeer. Um, it took a couple of years before follow-up work came, and this is a work by Matt Wett et al. 2010. They looked at minimalized um, subkeying, minimalized rekeying, 
where instead of a random function, you take a universal hash function. Um, so notably, it really, really resembles the idea of Abdallah Balara, although Matrad et al. didn't notice this connection. Um, four years later, the Browning et al. they mounted a key recovery attack on the scheme in the birthday bound, and they presented two remedies, which I called DKM plus one and DKM plus two, named after the authors. Um, DKM plus two is particularly interesting. Um, it's this construction that uses a tweakable block cipher and it puts the rekeyer on top. So instead of a normal block cipher, it uses a tweakable block cipher and the rekeyer goes into the rekeying function, but also into the tweakable block cipher. Um, but if you think about rekeying uh, in a broader sense, and if you think about tweakable block ciphers in a broader sense, you might conclude that they somehow share ideas. So intuitively, a rekeying function is really comparable to a tweakable block cipher. The interface is the same. Um, the goal is the same. They both do block encryption. Uh, it can be used to do block encryption. So the idea of rekeying reminds a bit of tweakable block ciphers. There is one subtle difference, and this difference is that in a rekeying scheme, uh, tweak change or a rekeyer change results in a different key to the underlying block cipher. Um, in tweakable block ciphers, this is originally not the case, but there have been schemes where this is the case, and this is known as tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers. So in a tweak rekeyable tweakable block cipher, one takes a normal block cipher and one builds a tweakable block cipher on top of that that changes the key to the block cipher if the tweak also changes. Um, so this term already dates back to a couple of years, uh, to around 2015-2017. Um, but it turns out actually that although the field of rekeying was not that developed, the field of tweakable block ciphers, and also in particular the field of tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers, has a vast literature. Um, already in 2009, Minimatsu presented um, a tweak rekeyable tweakable block cipher avant la lettre. And the scheme might remind you of an earlier scheme, namely the one of Abdallah and Belare. It's really a comparable scheme, but the design goal is different. Abdallah and Belare try to find a random function, a pseudo random function, and Minimatsu um, targeted a, an invertible primitive. Um, Notably, um, from this perspective, the scheme of Matrad et al. can be seen to be a closer match to the one of Minamatsu than the one of Abdallah and Belare, even though they didn't draw this parallel. Uh, in 2015, um, I introduced two beyond birthday bound secure tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers. And the idea is that the key and the tweak, they get added to get the subkey, um, which in general, of course, for leakage, it's not a very good idea, but in the black box setting, this is fine. And the key and the tweak also get mingled to get the masking to the, uh, to the input and the output value of the block cipher. Um, Wang et al. patched one small gap in the MEN2 construction and also generalized this construction to 32 uh, schemes, which I will not depict. And Naito uh, presented a tweak rekeyable scheme that targeted authenticated encryption. And eventually, Jado introduced XHX, which is a generalized construction where you have a block cipher and you have a universal hash function H, an input of the key and the tweak that generates three um, sub keys one that goes into the block cipher and two that go into the mask. And what we see basically is that the knowledge on tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers is quite solid. So, tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers have received quite some attention, but rekeying solutions not so much. And this leads to an interesting question can we use this knowledge on tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers to improve our solutions in rekeying? And this is the question that I analyzed in this work, and I presented three solutions based on tweak rekeyable tweakable block ciphers. Uh, the first one I called R1. It is a derivative of MEN1, although it's not the same. Um, so it takes the block cipher. And then the subkey is derived using a universal hash function, U, and then U gets also multiplied with the uh, rekeyer R. Um, it has a restriction that the K 
kappa, the key size to the block size must be equal to the regular size must be equal to the block size, but in this case it gets 2n over 3-bit security. The second construction is R2. It's not based on MEM2, but rather on Wang et al's construction number 12, which was better suited for this. It also takes kappa as equal to rho is equal to n. Um, it is not identical to this construction, um, there, but it's rather different to suit the rekeying purpose. But still, I managed to prove n-bit uh, security of this construction. And finally, we take uh, I present R3, which is an adaptation or basically a simplification of XHX. Recall that XHX uses um, a universal hash function that generates three subkeys. And now it only generates two subcase U and a V that goes into the masking. And this one achieves n bit security if the key size is equal to the block size. And finally, it also covers permutation based um, constructions. If kappa equals zero, then you get birthday bound security. Um, in the paper, I give a full justification of why um, I select these three schemes as inspiration. And also, I give a proof of these constructions. I will not go into details. Uh, for the proof, um, but rather I will consider more, focus more on the applications in this presentation. Uh, but before doing so, let me first make a comparison. Uh, for simplicity, take a kappa is equal to rho is equal to n. Um, f denotes a random function, tilde e a equal block cipher and e a block cipher. And for the sake of counting, assume that the universal hash function is as expensive as one n with finite field multiplication. And then these are the numbers. So I split the cost into the subkey cost, which needs strong, for instance, DPA protection, and the core cost, which needs weak, uh, for instance, SPA protection. And note that here the universal hash of R2 costs 2 because it, uh, it uses a universal hash function that generates two subkeys. Um, and now if you compare, for instance, if you compare, for instance, R2 with DKM1. Uh, R2 and DKM1 is equally expensive, so the subkey function is equally expensive, the core is equally expensive, the key size is equally expensive, also the state is equally high, but it achieves optimal security. If you compare R3 to DKM2, um, you see that it's, it's a bit different. So DKM2 uses a dedicated tweakable block cipher in the core, whereas R3 uses normal block cipher, conventional block cipher, um, but it also needs additional subkey generation and it then gets a larger key. Um, not necessarily, but if you take finite field multiplication, it gets a 2 bit key. Um, because security is the same. So basically what we see is that it's a trade-off between what primitive can you use, what primitive do you want to use, and which scheme is more suited. And the cool thing of these solutions is that they are not just rekeying schemes on their own, so you don't need to put them on top of a block cipher. You can actually use them as tweakable block cipher, noting that a rekeying scheme and a tweakable block cipher scheme uh, is basically the same. And this is particularly interesting in light of the fact that the tweakable block cipher is a very popular primitive for mode design. To give you an example, in the Caesar competition that ended um, a couple of years ago, 18 out of 57 schemes were based on a tweakable block cipher. Also, many Mac functions like ZMac are based on a tweakable block cipher. And here I depicted this typical example Zeta CB, and let me quickly recap it from the second, from the first slide. So we have a key that goes into all block cipher calls, all tweakable block cipher calls. We get messages that get processed independently. We've got associated data and a checksum that will be processed to get a tag. Um, it's a very popular and very widely used design, um, although not in this, not necessarily in this shape. Um, for example, OCB3, or also OCB2, but most notably OCB3, is TetaCB instantiated with the XEX tweakable block cipher. XEX is a tweakable block cipher on top of a normal block cipher. Um, the Oxus one for example, uses TetaCB, but then instantiates it, with a, instantiates it with a dedicated Deoxys BC tweakable block cipher. But one can just as well instantiate the scheme with a rekeyer. 
And this brings me to a typical example, Theta CBR3. And Theta CBR3 is just Theta CB with, uh, instantiated with the R key Re gear. This means that the tweaks that were input to the Twigo block ciphers now serve as a Re gear um, to the scheme. Um, and this gives some nice features. So it achieves n bit security. Um, it makes a, um, a normal amount of lightly protected block cipher calls and makes strongly protected universal hash function calls. And by design, it is easier to protect against side channel attacks. Um, and the reason for this is that R3 is. And it's particularly interesting to see what happens if you take a scheme with a permutation. So the sub key in the key size to the block cipher is zero, but then you get birthday bound security, but it's based on a random permutation. If you compare it now, for instance, to OCB3, OCB3 only gets birthday bound security. However, this is security in the standard model. And it turns out that it is impossible to prove optimal security in the, uh, in the standard model if you base it on a tweak wall block cipher. Um, so only, it only gets n over 2 bit security, but in the standard model, um, on the downside, it makes strongly protected block cipher calls. So you need to strongly protect the block ciphers, the block cipher evaluation. Um, if you compare it to DTE, which is Digest Tag Encrypt by Berti et al., um, I would like to mention that it is hard to compare it because they have a different goal. They target non misuse resistance. It's a different uh, approach and this also leads to a different type of scheme. But it's still interesting to kind of count the cost. And here we looked at the scheme where the hash function of DTE is based on a block cipher. So it's for instance Merkle Damgaard based on Davis Meyer. Um, then you get a normal amount of unprotected calls. You also need lightly protected calls and strongly protected calls. So you have a different goal, different primitives that need to be protected. Um, and this also gives a different setting. Not particularly that DTA is sequential, whereas TTCB is parallel. Um, to conclude, what we have observed is that two different fields basically consider the same problem. And you can use solutions from one of them um, to obtain solutions for the other direction. Uh, a bit more on the rekeying um, approach. Um, I already mentioned for simplicity, let's look at multiplication for the finite field multiplication for the universal hash. But it has been shown that multiplication is not strong enough. One can mount side channel attacks on this multiplication. Um, so it's interesting to see what other solutions can we take for the subkey generation. Um, it's interesting to note that ISAP, a submission to the NIST lightweight competition, uses a sponge for rekeying. And this appears to be a very solid approach. This concludes my presentation. So thank you for your attention.